Welcome to episode number five of the CJ Wellman Show. This week we are talking about Syria, because if we don't, then who will? And then later in this program we'll show you why there's reason to be hopeful that Israel's days as an occupying force in the Palestinian territories are numbered. But first, a polite reminder that if you're a fan of this program and you'd like to help us grow and expand, giving a voice to the voiceless, then please do so by becoming a member at patreon.com forward slash CJ Wellman. Exclusive membership benefits for those who do. Thank you. Now let's get into it. The Syrian civil war is now in its 11th year, but the international news media long ago stopped caring about the Syrian people, pausing only to recognize the dictator Bashar al-Assad's election landslide victory on Wednesday, in which he beat out his direct opponents, all of whom look suspiciously like Bashar al-Assad. Paint me surprised, but it's pretty difficult to lose an election after you've eliminated all of your political opposition and erased 12 million of your voters, while threatening to imprison, shoot or displace those who remain in the country and eligible to vote. Okay, sure, Assad did run against two opponents, but both were completely unknown and neither bothered to run an actual campaign. Heck, the guy who came in second with 3% of the vote is only 28 followers on Twitter. By means of comparison, my one-year-old cat, Mr. Biggles, has 29. Now here's the thing, I want to believe there's a special place in hell for those who put up their campaign billboards in front of the very same residential apartment buildings they had earlier bombed to hold on to power. But for now he gets to enjoy the fruit of his labour, that labour being the sectarian cleansing of 12 million Sunni Muslims. Okay, let me make this statement. This program strongly opposes religious sectarianism of any kind. Sectarianism is a tool used by the powerful to divide and conquer populations. Libraries are filled with books on how European colonial states, for instance, kept Muslims divided in mutual hatred during the previous century, for the sole objective of plundering their lands and pillaging their resources. Look, it matters not if you're a Protestant or Catholic or Sunni or Shia or Sufi or even an Ahmadi Muslim. If you self-identify as a Christian or a Muslim, and you believe Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad to offer a direct path to the Lord Almighty, then you get to call yourself a Christian or Muslim. Anyway, that's my view, and that's a view taken by this show. And I wanted to make that statement clearly before we examine what's actually happening in Syria today. Assad's strategy for holding on to power and to prevent another repeat of 2011, when millions of Syrians took to the streets in protest against his repressive rule while calling for modest political, economic and social reforms, is to swap out the Sunni population in exchange for Assad regime friendly Shia migrants from Iran, Lebanon and elsewhere. This is the textbook definition of sectarian cleansing. You see, prior to the war, the Syrian population was 85% Muslim, with 85% of them Sunni, and therefore because the Assad regime privileged and elevated non-Sunni Muslims, particularly Shia, Alawite and even Christian minorities, it was Sunni Muslims who comprised the lion's share of the Syrian uprising. So the city is Assad bombed into dust, including Homs and Eastern Huta, with the help from his Russian and Iranian allies, are being rebuilt and replenished under the auspice of the Iranian regime. A senior Lebanese leader said this, and I quote, Iran and the Assad regime don't want any Sunnis between Damascus and Homs and the Lebanese border, which represents a historic shift in populations. This is not only about Assad wanting to preserve his rule, but also about his number one benefactor, Iran, wanting to rebuild Syria into a country that reflects its identity and advances its strategic interests in the region. I mean, Iran is doing the exact same thing in Iraq at this very moment, where Iranian militias are carrying out a wave of political assassinations with the full support of the Tehran-controlled central government in Baghdad. In other words, this is Iranian imperialism, the kind of imperialism that so-called anti-imperialists among the Western left claim to oppose, but actually endorse full-heartedly by promoting and parroting conspiracy theories that deny war crimes and genocide for the sole purpose of scoring cheap political points against the US government. I mean, the US does plenty of really bad stuff around the world, particularly in the Middle East, without having to make stiff up, particularly because doing so adds victimization to the actual victims of war crimes and genocide. Now let's get this straight. The denial of genocide is the continuation of genocide violence. So those who traffic genocide denialism are complicit in genocide violence. I mean, take a look at this heinous ghoul. This American blogger is in Syria at this very moment to report his conspiracy theories and chemical weapons denialism back to a naive and gullible audience in the United States on behalf of the Assad regime to help rehabilitate its global image. Now take a look at his tweet. 
The rubble he's standing before was an apartment building bombed by Assad regime warplanes, but he makes no mention of this undeniable fact, also failing to mention that the people who lived there were Palestinian refugees who were slaughtered and displaced because they had rebelled against Assad in 2013. I mean, even this scumbag's employers reported as such on the date this attack occurred, before much later deleting their tweets in order to allegedly secure funding from Russia. Imagine being so morally depraved and so desperate for Russian blood money that you'd be willing to debase yourself and the families of the 3,000 Palestinian refugees that were slaughtered in Yarmouk by this century's most bloodthirsty dictator. This is like standing before the gates of Auschwitz and then claiming the Holocaust never happened and it was a giant propaganda drive or psyop by the CIA to mobilize global support for the D-Day landings in Normandy. We are talking about more than a half a million dead Syrians here and the permanent displacement of more than 12 million refugees who languish in squalid and COVID-19 infested refugee camps throughout the Middle East and the Mediterranean, along with 3 million who remain trapped along the Turkish border in Idlib province, where they are bombed periodically by Russian warplanes from the sky above and stalked by Iranian death squads on the ground below. They also face persecution from the rebel group that controls this piece of territory, namely Tahrir al-Sham, commonly referred to in the Western media by its acronym HTS, an amalgamation of Sunni Islamist groups. You see, when Syrians rose up against Assad, they demanded justice and freedom from tyranny, but a failure by the international community to provide meaningful and substantial tools to defend themselves from Assad Russian air power, along with a myopic focus on defeating Daesh or ISIS, left these Islamist groups as the only organized resistance forces on the ground in opposition to the regime. Today, HDS is governing its held territory, every bit as ruthless and anti-democratic as the regime the Syrian people had fled from. These poor and helpless people have been hammered from pillar to post, and worse, they've been forgotten. Now, obviously, we don't have enough time in this program today to discuss potential solutions for victims of the Assad regime and HDS, but I wanted to explain the reality of the conflict and the situation is today because these people are in desperate need of our solidarity. And nothing has done more to undermine global solidarity for the Syrian people than the lies told about them by sadistic American bloggers who pose as pro-Palestinian activists. Please keep the Syrian people in your hearts and minds. Okay, now for some good news. Benjamin Netanyahu, the American-accented used car salesman who could sell a dirty diaper as a high-end fashion accessory, will no longer be the Prime Minister of Israel after a coalition of right-wing, centrist and leftist parties have handed him his first election defeat since 1999. The odds of Netanyahu spending time in prison on corruption charges have thus become measurably greater. But here's the bad news. Meet his successor, Naftali Bennett. When he isn't bragging about murdering Arabs, he's promising to never allow the Palestinian people the right to live in freedom and peace. He even once told my friend Mehdi Hassan that Israel's right to steal Palestinian land is written in the Bible, despite the fact that the state of Israel didn't come into existence a full 5,000 years after the Old Testament was written. He now joins a long line of Israeli leaders who have expressed dehumanizing and genocidal contempt for the indigenous population of the land that they call Israel, but the rest of the world recognizes to be historic Palestine. But here's some more good news. The shot clock has finally begun counting down on Israel's criminal occupation of the Palestinian territories and system of apartheid rule. Global attitudes towards Israel are not only hardening, but also global solidarity and boycott movements are coalescing against it. In the past week alone, 200,000 marched in solidarity for Palestine in London, 50,000 in Chicago, 12,000 in Washington DC, and I was among thousands at a rally held in Melbourne, Australia two weeks ago. This younger generation of Palestinians have awoken to the fact that their freedom doesn't lie with international institutions and nation-state alliances that have betrayed them over and over again, but rather with people like you and me, and hundreds of millions of others around the world. This is a generation adept at social media and familiar with the potential power global solidarity movements hold for effecting positive change. They are shouting their cries for justice, liberty and peace from the streets of Jerusalem and Ramallah and now their voices are being heard and echoed on the streets of capital cities around the world. Your days as an occupying force are numbered, Israel. You have no choice other than to comply with international law or you'll be choked off from the rest of the world like other rogue regimes. You are fast headed for a fate that befell apartheid South Africa in the early 1990s. The moral arc of the universe inevitably bends towards justice. Well, that's all we have time for this week, and thanks for tuning in. Please like and subscribe to this channel, and please help spread the word with your family and friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
And a final reminder to consider supporting our endeavor by becoming a member of this show at patreon.com forward slash CJ Willman. But for now, good night, good morning, or good day, wherever you are, and stay blessed. Thank you.